Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all today to our session on the role of knowledge in the energy transition. We are honored today to have with us uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Rabia Farouhi. Dr. Rabia Farouhi is the director of the Knowledge Policy and Finance Center at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. She oversees the agency's work on knowledge, policy and finance, including efforts to produce up-to-date and authoritative renewable energy data and information, and also to analyze and to identify the best practices in re renewable energy policies and finance. Furthermore, the work of Dr. Fedouhi includes advice and support to countries, policy tailoring and investment analysis to renewables deployment in the field. She has over 20, year, 20 years of experience in the field of energy development and environment, working in both public and private sectors, as well as with governments in the Middle East and North Africa, energy companies in the Mediterranean region and the GCC and international institutions as well. Dr. Farouhi holds a master's degree in applied economics and a PhD in economics from the American University in Washington, DC. We would like to welcome uh, Dr. Farouhi again, and I will um, give the floor uh, to Dr. Farouhi. Uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elsa, for your kind words. And, and really, it's a pleasure for me to join all of you today in this Knowledge Summit. Uh, obviously, knowledge, data, and uh, analysis is, is really at the core of the work that we do at uh, IRENA, uh, where all this knowledge uh, is then used for uh, uh, informed decision-making in the energy transition towards a, a sort of more sustainable energy future. So uh, just very briefly, for those who don't know IRENA, we're an intergovernmental organization headquartered in Abu Dhabi uh, since 2011. And uh, we, our mandate is to promote uh, the transformation of the global energy system uh, uh, and the adoption basically of all forms of renewable energy. Uh, we serve uh, like a, a, a knowledge hub, um, an advisory resource, and the objective uh, global voice for renewable energy. Um, the agency has uh, over 180 countries as members. Uh, and of course, uh, we have a lot of global partners to pro promote uh, and collaborate with uh, in order to, to support the, the transition to a better energy future. Uh, as was just mentioned, I, I, I'm the director of one of the uh, 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 divisions dealing with knowledge, policy and finance. So, Doctor, yeah, sorry, Dr. Rabia, to interrupt you, I just need to make an announcement for our online audience. Sorry, just one, uh, one minute. For interpretation and to get the certificates, we kindly ask you, our audience online, to join the link below the video. And for interpretation, if you would like to get the interpretation into Arabic, please hover on the screen and click on the headphones icon and choose Arabic language. Okay, thank you. And sorry, Dr. Rabia. Not at all, not at all. Thank you very much. So what we're going to look at today in the half hour or so that we have together is um, uh, what type of knowledge is really needed for the energy transition. Uh, when we talk about uh, knowledge uh, for the energy transition, what do we mean? We mean first, uh, one of the questions that we need to answer is where we are today. Where are we today? So uh, what is the current status of the sector? W what kind of trends are we seeing? Uh, what, are the pro what is the progress that, have, that we've made towards achieving certain goals and ambitions? The second area, as you see on the slide, it, it, of knowledge and sort of answers the question, where do we want to go? And uh, that means what kind of vision we have for the energy transition over the coming decades, uh, what go goals we, we want to achieve, uh, not only in, in the longer term, but also in the short term, um, and especially after the COVID crisis in terms of trying to build better, uh, build back better, 
And then what are the, the benefits for society and the economy uh, from such a transition uh, of the energy system? Um, and then the, the last question we're trying to answer is basically how do we get there? What, what kind of, of environment policies do we need? What kind of investments are required in order to achieve that trans energy transition and the benefits that could ge be generated? So um, we will today look at, of course, we cannot go into great depth, but we will give you some ideas of how to answer some of these questions. So in terms of where we are now, uh, we're going to look at the current status of the sector and some of the trends that we have been seeing. You can see on the slide on data and statistics that we produce, uh, ARENA produces a, a wide range of uh, applied knowledge products and tools that inform decision making for the energy transition. So we gather data and statistics on different topics uh, that includes energy capacity, power generation, the kind of jobs that you get in the, in the energy transition, the costs, the investments, the patents uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, intellectual property, et cetera. Um, we have, for example, the Global Atlas, which I think would be very interesting for many of you, for renewable energy, which is a free web-based platform that provides users with data and tools to an, uh, assess the, the renewable energy potential in the country. And, and we have that not only at the country level, for example, but also at the city level, what kind of renewables you can, uh, you can, you can deploy, at what cost, et cetera. Now, all of these platforms and databases are freely available to the public uh, because we, we operate on the principle uh, principles of knowledge being a public good. So again, we encourage you uh, to, to go to ARENA's website and explore all these resources and understand better how the, en the energy transition is unfolding. Now, in terms of trends, uh, we, uh, uh, we see that in terms of power capacity, so electricity, uh, we, we have seen already transformational changes in the way that uh, energy is, is generated and stored and, and distributed. So, uh, as I said, this is true particularly for electricity, the electricity sector, uh, where last year or in 2020, Renewables accounted for 82% of all newly installed power capacities. So, so that means that uh, the, the remaining 18% are fossil fuel and nuclear in terms of new power addition, which clearly shows that renewables are not a niche. They're in terms of new capacity available for, for electricity, very important, the majority of them. And despite the COVID-19 pandemic, more than 260 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity was added globally in 2020, uh, uh, beating uh, previous records uh, by almost 50%. Now, why is this happening? A lot, of ha a lot of this is happening in terms of greater deployment and expansion of renewable energy because there have been countries that have introduced policies that supported the uptake of renewables. And this includes countries like Germany with feed-in tariffs, the US, uh, other countries as well. And more recently, we have seen that countries have supported the deployment of renewables like in the UAE through auctions. So there are policies that we introduce in order to support a greater deployment of renewables. Uh, but another important driver uh, through the past couple, uh, past uh, decade is the falling cost of renewables. So renewable power generation has become very competitive. And in many, many contexts, in majority in contexts, there are less costly than fossil fuel or nuclear-based uh, power, power generation. Um, solar PV is the, 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 has seen the, 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 the greatest decline of, in cost over the past decade by 82%. And you see that on the, on the slide. And that's followed by concentrated uh, solar power, 47%, onshore wind, 40%, and offshore wind, 29%. Now, uh, of course, this, this spectacular increase, uh, 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 progress uh, has been made in the power sector, 
but there's still a long way to go in other sectors, uh, in particular heating and cooling, which account for almost half of global energy demand and are responsible for about 40% of CO2 emissions uh, from the energy sector. So th there is still a, a long way to go in order to meet the, the, the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in terms of uh, of um, not uh, increasing global temperatures above uh, uh, 1.5 degrees by 2050. Um, so again, the sectors of uh, of heating and cooling and and, and transport are are, are also uh, heavily fossil fuel based. Transport accounts for 30 percent of energy use. And, and and there again, just like in heating, heating and cooling, we need a lot of progress. Uh, to, 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 to have a greater penetration of renewable energy. Now, in terms of investments into renewable energy, uh, we definitely need a scale up of investment towards uh, investment in, in, in clean energy technologies, in particular energy, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, uh, system power system flexibility, etc. So, so if you see on the graph now, uh, the global renewable energy investments have increased quite steadily since 2013. They have peaked to 350 billion in 27 before declining in 2018. Now, the drop in 2018 is really due to the falling technology costs that you have just seen in the former um, in the former slide, uh, because it allows for a greater capacity to be added with the same amount of investments. Uh, solar PV and onshore wind uh, co consolidated their dominance in terms of investment through that period that you see of in the, on the slide. And together they, they account for 75% uh, of renewable energy investment. Now, data is, 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 is obviously, as you know, very important. And it's also important when it comes to tracking the progress towards achieving uh, energy and climate goals. Um, uh, measurement and tracking is, is vital in order to hold uh, uh, not only government, but everyone, uh, all stakeholders accountable and, and, and for a reassessing different policies and measures that are needed to, 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 to adjust, that need adjusting in order to further promote uh, deployment of renewables and in general, the energy transition. So one of these examples of tracking is the sustainable development goals. Uh, IRENA is one of the custodian agencies with the four other agencies when it comes to tracking um, the achievement uh, or progress towards uh, um, SDG 7 which is SDG 7 is achieving, uh, ensuring that we have access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all by 2030. So uh, their renewable energy also plays uh, obviously a very important uh, role to achieve the, this 2030 agenda. And um, uh, for example, uh, energy access can help to create uh, new economic opportunities, and therefore reduce uh, poverty. And there, here we're highlighting basically the link that the energy acts, uh, the energy, uh, the central order of energy in achieving other sustainable development goals. It helps in electrifying school, which improves education. Um, uh, cleaning cooking, clean cooking uh, will reduce uh, re respiratory illnesses, and, and so. Basically, you can see the different linkages that uh, that uh, that we can achieve by achieving SDG seven in terms of getting uh, uh, achieving uh, access to energy. Um, and, but, but but the problem is that we're not at all on track uh, in terms of achieving the targets under NGG seven SDG seven. And this is uh, particularly true of the very vulnerable countries, uh, and and uh, that that um, uh, uh, as well as those that are already lagging. Uh, for example, the number of uh, people without access to electricity uh, uh, fell from 1.2 billion globally in 2010 to 2019. But uh, uh, what happened because of COVID is that these gains are being reversed. So 
you know, this is just one example of what we have to achieve under SDG 7. But I think the most important point to, to highlight there is even though we've made a lot of progress, we are, we are falling behind the objectives of 2030. Uh, now, the second question, as I told you, is uh, where we're aiming to go. Uh, so you have a sort of idea of the current status of the sector and, and, and where, where we are now. And now we're going to look at uh, uh, basically where we want to go uh, by focusing, obviously, on ARENA's vision of the energy transition and the renewable energy future. So if you look at uh, this slide, um, uh, you will see there uh, that we are entering a decade which will be really a defining decade uh, in terms of the, the chances that we have in keeping temperature rise uh, to 1.5 degree. Uh, <clears throat> and this is becoming uh, more and more uh, a reality um, to people. I mean, the con I think people are more and more aware of the fact that we have very little time left to 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 change uh, to to change things, and Arena has uh, developed uh, uh, what we have an, a publication that is called the World Energy Transition Outlook, that shows a path toward uh, a more resilient and equitable world, and 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 sort of guides the priorities and the work of uh, Irina. Um, which which I will be highlighting. So this outlook um, towards a more resilient future uh, uh, shows a, a path that is more, more most likely <clears throat> to reduce uh, emissions in the coming decade and set the trajectory for development um, uh, with the with the most uh, promising technologies. It, it, it has a timeline and, and clarity on the steps to be taken to manage the, the, the transition from fossil fuels. And it shows that uh, success is possible if the process is inclusive. And that means that it needs the engagement of citizens at the local level uh, to ensure that all countries uh, of the world have an opportunity to keep pace with and, 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 and benefit uh, in, in a just and fair way from the transition. So if you look at the, the, the investment priorities, so their renewables, energy efficiency, and electrification, uh, you see the slide from the World Energy Transition Outlook, which shows that pathway to 1.5 degree by 2050. Uh, again, it shows very clearly that the window of opportunity is narrow and therefore we really need to prioritize the technologies that are available today uh, so they can be deployed at scale by 2030 and therefore make a meaningful shift towards a net zero energy system by 2050. So the analysis we, we, we have finds that renewables, efficiency and electrification really provide the bulk of emission abatement by 2050. Uh, the most important shift is the increasing use of low-cost renewable power to electrify end uses we would just talk about, which is basically heating, cooling, and transport. And uh, we also increasingly talk about green hydrogen as being one of the key solutions as well to this uh, pathway. In terms of investment, we Arena's 1.5 scenario shows that we require an additional $33 trillion over the planned investment from, from today uh, over to 2050. Now, <clears throat> Uh, Irina has also been analyzing um, the broader potential benefits of renewables uh, since the early days of the agency. Uh, you can see on the slide all the different kinds of reports we have been publishing over the past decade that have focused on, 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 on how renewables can, can provide benefits, wider benefits, while adding value to local economies. So you have, I'm not going to go into them, but just to summarize, we assess existing renewable energy uh, jobs worldwide. We uh, measure the expected socioeconomic impacts of the deployment of this energy transition. 
uh, uh, up to the year 2050. And this is done through an econometric model that we have. We analyze how to um, leverage domestic capacity through local supply chain development and related measures, and therefore uh, ensure that there is a local value that is created. And you have probably seen throughout the, the pandemic that the discussion around global supply chain has become very important because we saw through the, during the pandemic that this became a problem. And then we examine ways to ensure that the benefits are shared widely, including for skills uh, that are rendered obsolete in the conventional energy sector, for, for example, or also by looking at the gender dimension, et cetera. So this is, uh, all these aspects are very important to our member governments because uh, if they're trying to promote renewables and energy efficiency and the energy transition in general in their country, they need to, to, to have evidence on how renewables can provide wider benefits uh, to their societies uh, while adding value uh, uh, to local economies. So if we look at the socioeconomic footprints that I just spoke about, basically what we do is look at these technologies that the energy transition is going to uh, uh, is going to uh, uh, implement, and we see what kind of impact it has on variables like GDP, uh, jobs, welfare, and how it affects basically societies and economies. Uh, so here you see some example of the results for for 2030. The pathway that we propose, which is one that leads us to a 1.5 degree. Uh, 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 temperature increase by 2050 would boost GDP uh, by 2.4% uh, above what would be the case under current plans and strategy. So it means that going uh, this a more ambitious pathway in terms of sustainability is going to actually improve uh, GDP. Uh, and we see also that welfare uh, is is uh, is also much better. Uh, uh, the, the the results on the welfare on welfare impacts are very very high with this more ambitious strategy. Uh, we also estimate that a lot of jobs will be created um, uh, in terms of uh, renewable energy jobs. Uh, we see that by twenty. Uh, uh, 30 or uh, we will have 43 million renewable energy jobs and some of the numbers you can get on our um, on our uh, website all the publications that we have are um, available uh, for free on our website and so all these numbers you can get from uh, what you see here the veto the world energy transition outlook now how will we get there I'm very sorry, I muted myself. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, now the, the third question that we're answering is how do we get there basically? And of course there's a lot to do, but uh, we, we, we sort of have the technologies and if we're only looking at 2030, I, I, as I just said, we should be looking at the, the technologies that are already available and how to uh, up, you know, scale up their deployment. So in this remaining 10 years, let's say to 2030, achieving these objectives of 2030, so we have a chance of making 2050, uh, what, 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 what can we do? Basically, the, the, we need political will, obviously, and policies and measures that can help us achieve that transition and, and at the same time provide the, the benefits uh, to uh, uh, to, to society at large. Um, and if you see the next slide is, is about this sort of comprehensive policy, policy framework that is uh, needed for the, 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 the a just energy transition, for an energy transition first, but also a just energy transition. So obviously we will continue to need deployment policies that have helped until now, like as I mentioned before, feed-in tariffs that have been used auctions, have targets, etc. But uh, beyond that, um, we will also need a comprehensive policy framework that considers uh, people, prosperity and planet, uh, as you can see on this on this uh, uh, slide. 
Uh, and this is where I think Irina provides a unique value. Uh, we have had the privilege to work with countries from all corners of the world. As I said, uh, we have uh, uh, over 170 countries that are member of Irina. And we gain a lot of insights across, across a, a range of, of transition issues uh, in, in very different kind of contexts in terms of uh, geographies, economies, societies. So this rich policy knowledge base uh, has really provided guidance uh, on the different types of policies that are needed uh, to deploy the energy transition pathway that we uh, recommend and maximize socioeconomic benefits. And policies to support the growing deployment and integration of renewable energy, so the, the ones I just spoke about, must go hand in hand with measures that ensure that industrial and other economic capabilities are aligned with the development and climate objectives. So you need effective labor market intervention that can match jobs with qualified applicants, uh, promote, uh, promote the employee well-being, facilitate on and off job training towards renewable energy and energy employment and, and, and other energy transition uh, type of em employment. And implementing, of course, also job safety nets with the measures to facilitate labor mobility, et cetera. We also need proactive uh, just transition strategies uh, to minimize socioeconomic disruptions through targeted public investments and economic diversification measures for affected regions and communities. And as you know, many countries, including in the region, uh, have been doing so to diversify their economies and prepare for, the, for uh, a sustainable future where they would have a role to play in terms of uh, even as energy leaders. Um, so, uh, uh, another aspect which we will talk about uh, again in two minutes is also targeted education and skills development policies and programs that can allow workers to, to take uh, full advantage of the job opportunities that come with energy transition. Also reduce or avoid the mismatch that can happen between skill demand and supply. Also uh, retrain fossil fuel workers into the new kinds of jobs that will have uh, take uh, th that the, the energy transition will generate. So uh, all these uh, policies support the, the, the that I spoke about. All of them together support the the structural shifts uh, uh, that, that that the energy transition brings with it, and, and makes sure that people and com communities can can thrive, and that economies are more inclusive, just, and resilient. So what do we need financial, in terms of financing uh, as far as this is concerned? I'm not going to go too much into detail, but you can see on the slide that, um, uh, that we, need, uh, the, uh, we need financing, obviously. Uh, but the financing that we have received for the energy transition, the world has received for the, financial, for the energy transition to date is nowhere near enough. We need a lot more. Uh, from the, 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 the global climate flows that we've received uh, in 2018-19 uh, of about oh, over $600 billion, two-thirds two went to renewables. But for example, finance for adaptation has only been $46 billion. Um, the, the financing needs are really estimated to $5 trillion a year, including both mitigation and adaptation. So um, we will need a, a lot more uh, financing, both from the public and the private sector. We also need a greater commitment from the financial, uh, from the international community. For example, um, at COP15, uh, uh, yeah, COP15 in 2009, developed countries uh, had made pledges to mobilize $100 billion a year of climate finance if to developing country. The target has never been met. Um, so. Uh, the good news is that COP26, and hopefully this will uh, be implemented, uh, uh, there were a lot of pledges that were made, um, uh, and as well as a uh, uh, substantial uh, uh, reduction of uh, financing into coal, um, and uh, also uh, the, the, a pledge to double uh, glo global adaptation finance. So it's now projected that the $100 billion dollar per year will be met in 2023, 
and may be exceeded later. So um, the, 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 the point is that what we need to do is really make sure that, uh, that we scale up our ambitions and, and put the financing where is needed. If you look at NDCs, that's the next slide, um, the NDCs are commitments that, that countries make uh, to basically combat climate change. Uh, 100 in 2021, uh, 194 countries have submitted uh, their nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement. Out of those, um, 151 had uh, submitted new or updated uh, contributions. Um, um, and within those 150 uh, submit, new submitted uh, uh, NDCs, 91 uh, uh, parties, that's what they're called, uh, uh, submitted uh, uh, more than 60% of global GHG emission. So collectively, 90 parties have introduced um, uh, commitments that would reduce global GHG emissions by over 60%. And that's how they enhance their ambitions compared to the previous NDCs. Uh, then there are another 60 parties that 60 parties that accounted for 18 percent of global emissions that submitted also uh, gr greater ambitions uh, uh, to to get the same emission reductions or increased emissions compared to their first NDCs and the remaining countries or parties uh, int intend to submit NDCs uh, or have provided no indication to submit them. That's about 20% of the global GHG emission. I think the most important here to, to maybe keep in mind is that 90, par 90 parties to, that provided their contribution, um, uh, they have enhanced or their ambitions or increased their ambitions, which would account for uh, more than 60% of uh, global emission uh, a reduction. So I think important to know also is that the G20 members account for about 75% of our global GHG emissions. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, out of these 20, 19 have submitted a new uh, or, or updated NDCs. And um, 11 only countries submitted stronger pledges um, uh, than, than the, the original one. So uh, a lot more has to be done. Um, and then obviously you have a lot of countries that submit uh, pledges like LDCs and, and SIDS, um, and they're just really responsible for very, very, very minor um, part or share of the global GHG emissions. Uh, for the case of LDCs and SIDS, it's about 7% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as I said, compared to the 20 G20 countries, which together accounts for 75% of total emissions. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of what countries are should be doing. Now, um, so with this greater urgency to, to, to safeguard the future of our planet, uh, we're seeing more and more countries, cities, companies setting net zero targets for their greenhouse gas emissions over the coming uh, years or decades. Um, and um, obviously, if, if, if this shift towards a green, uh, greener economy is happening, then, then we will have a very different world to the one we, we see today. And this will have major implication uh, on uh, the work world of, of, of uh, uh, work or uh, employment and future skilling demands. And this is why we have on the next slide, uh, the shift to renewable energy that will create new job, uh, jobs and opportunities for workers, their families, uh, their communities. So, so it's important to, uh, develop a, a workforce that is inclusive and, and where people of different backgrounds, including uh, women who currently are 32% of the labor force, um, 
uh, and other underrepresented groups uh, uh, can benefit uh, or contribute to this uh, sort of greener economy. So you can you, you can see on the on the on the on the slide that renewable energy will require people with many different kind of skills and occupational backgrounds. There's uh, individuals that will be required with uh, with the degrees in STEM field, uh, 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 science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, uh, that's about 30% of the required labor force. Uh, another 5% in non-technical professional fields like uh, uh, lawyers, uh, logistic experts, uh, marketing professionals, experts in regulation and standardization, etc. Uh, but, but, but what is very interesting is that many of the job or most of the jobs, actually a majority of the job, will not require university degrees. Um, instead, they will require skills uh, that are built through uh, different pathways, uh, including uh, vocational training, apprenticeship, uh, on-the-job training, etc. And so building the skills needed for the energy transition uh, while uh, uh, promoting a not knowledgeable uh, uh, citizenry uh, with informed voters, consumers, and decision makers are, is really what what is key over the coming decades and this is why arena has uh, long, is launching sorry a new global uh, platform on education and training uh, for the energy transition which will uh, bring uh, together uh, different international partners including unesco um, and uh, education and institutions to identify skilling needs due to develop curricula, train educators, exchange best practices in renewable energy education. And this platform, uh, uh, particularly the efforts that, uh, that we're, uh, we're, we're making on, uh, on Educate the Educators initiative, is being supported by the government of the United uh, Arab Emirates. So, so building capacity of young pe people is also vital for to address current and future knowledge and skills needs. I mean, there are shortages of, of skills needed uh, for jobs within the energy transition already now. And this is why ARENA has created a, a number of platforms to engage with and, and educate youth, including the ARENA Youth Forum, the Global Council on uh, Enabling Youth Action for SDG 7, and the ARENA Student Leaders Program, which is a three-month uh, month virtual training for university students. Now, um, since its inception, ARENA has, uh, as you may have seen from the form uh, earlier graph, on the different linkages that SDG 7 has. So energy is not an end in itself achieving as SDG 7, but it's what it allows you to allows us to achieve uh, uh, more broadly in terms, as I said, of education, in terms of, uh, of poverty eradication, in terms of uh, other aspects, other SDGs. And this is uh, uh, what you see on this graph. Uh, since its inception, ARENA has really taken a, a holistic approach to the energy transition, looking at the interlinkages with the other energy sect sectors, uh, and with society, with the economy. And this includes the nexus between energy and food, given that the world's food system accounts for uh, about 30% of the global energy consumption and 2.5% billion people globally rely on agriculture for their livelihoods. So we started a few years ago to, to with the publication uh, on renewable energy and the water energy and food nexus, where we place renewable energy at the center of the nexus with water and, and food and see the opportunities that exist uh, in, to integrate renewables in agriculture and the water sector and identify potential trade-offs uh, uh, and sustainability risks that can emerge. Uh, since then, we have expanded a lot on this work stream to look at knowledge, work, and policy analysis, like the ecosystems that are required to link energy supply with, with uh, livelihood application, technology-specific analysis, like 
solar irrigation, geothermal heat in agriculture, etc. Quantify the socioeconomic benefits uh, or, or impacts and the, the environmental ones. We've done a lot on gathering data and statistics, which, as I said, is important to track progress, um, but also there's just data missing. So we didn't have very little uh, on, on, on off-grid data, uh, solar pumps, uh, the use of biogas for cooking, et cetera. Uh, we have also looked at regional agri value chain uh, assessment to see how we can uh, identify in certain region uh, the energy gaps in specific sectors like in dairy, uh, vegetable value chain, and see how renewables can address some of those gaps. And then, of course, advocacy that we do with different institutions like with FUNFAO, uh, Food Systems Summit, etc., uh, in order to the coalition for, for action with uh, which is also a, a, a platform in Irina in order to look at agri renewables. So beyond agriculture, Irina is, is really looking extensively at that, as I said, this ecosystem that is required to scale up the use of renewables and strengthen the livelihoods uh, and support delivery of uh, public services such as health, and, and um, healthcare. So, um, as I just mentioned, there is this uh, Arena Coalition for Action, which you're, uh, I invite you to, you can look at the, at the website that we have, where we have a lot of uh, activities that I mentioned earlier, and, and where we really try to bring uh, on board all sorts of stakeholders, whether academia, industrial, uh, industry association, private sector, um, um, NGOs, etc., in order to maximize the impact and and and, and look at uh, some of the um, so it, it lo it listen to other voices and 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 and, ha and try to to provide the best uh, uh, information and the best uh, uh, policy recommendation to member states. Um, and to the uh, sector, we have in this arena coalition 120 leading renewable energy players. Uh, there are different working groups. I'm not going to go into it, but but you can have it in the slide. We look at the renewable energy investment, how citizens can be empowered to per, uh, participate in decision making, how to decarbonize those sectors that are, I told you are difficult, where uh, like transport and heating and cooling. Etc. I'm going to go through maybe just to mention also the the uh, there have, there is one working group on jobs where we're working with uh, ILO to advocate a just and inclusive energy transition. Um, so um, uh, maybe just to 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 finish on a, on a couple of uh, things. Uh, I just wanted to conclude by 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 speaking about the important role of knowledge-based decision making, which is at the heart, I think, of of your forum, um, uh, and and the policies in the energy transition. And um, uh, as you saw, we we're currently trying. The world is responding to a difficult health health crisis. Uh, where we're again uh, reminded of the crit critical role of affordable and renewable uh, and reliable energy uh, across all kinds of sectors, as, as I said, in, in particular health right now. And, and we see practical examples of how uh, meeting renewable development, uh, uh, sorry, meeting SDG 7, Sustainable Development Goal 7, contributes directly and indirectly to basically most other SDGs. So now as, we, as we're trying to recover from the pandemic and, and, and build a more inclusive and sustainable economy, we have to be really conscious of the interconnected nature of our energy system. And, and this complete uh, transformation of the energy system will have uh, ripple effects on, across sectors. And this is why we need this holistic approach that we I mentioned in the, uh, earlier on with this globe, including the planet, um, the the economy, sorry, and the society, in order to have a smooth transition and in order to, to really maximize uh, socioeconomic benefits and, and, and advance the, 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 the 2030 uh, sustainable development agenda, but also to ensure that these benefits that can, that can be generated from the energy transition 
are distributed in a more equal fashion because it could very well be that the energy transition uh, could generate benefits such as the winners of today could be the winners of tomorrow. We need to, to have for that, we, ha we need to address the structural um, uh, this misalignments and the structural realities uh, 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 that have brought inequality in the world in terms of, of economic uh, benefit and social benefits. Uh, and we cannot continue to have them embedded in the energy transition. So we need to address them with the energy transition. So finally, just one last slide uh, in terms of knowledge building is to highlight many of the uh, of the data and reports that uh, I've made reference to today. And again, they're free to access and download on the ARENA website. I, I have just spoken of, uh, you know, one little part of, of our work. There's a lot of work on technology, on partnerships, on finance, um, uh, that 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 you can find uh, uh, on the on the website, and that could be of interest to you, depending on the topics that you want to address. And I would like to 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 thank um, uh, my colleague uh, who who is with me uh, today, uh, Samah, uh, who is uh, working a lot on 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 creating all these knowledge platforms. Um, uh, and she's the person basically leading on all the youth uh, education and training uh, programs at ARENA uh, for her for all her efforts. And you can always uh, get in touch with her in order to, to learn more. And she's with me. She can also answer some of the questions that you have on this. Uh, so thank you again very much, Samah. And thank you for inviting us and uh, inviting ARENA. And thank you, Dr. Elsa, for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rabia, for a very, really informative presentation and uh, uh, to get to know more about the work done by uh, Irina in the field of energy transition. I will just uh, answer, uh, uh, ask you one question before I move to the question from our audience online, because we ended with knowledge. So what do you think are the some of the specific knowledge needs and priorities in the energy access context. Your mic, please. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was muted. I'm very sorry. Yeah, so, um, so I'm not sure I, I mentioned the number, but there's about uh, over 750 million people around the world that don't have access to energy. Um, so obviously, uh, addressing this issue is is one of the key pillars of Arena's work, and uh, we 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 conduct analysis in order to build uh, a knowledge base, um, gather, as I said, a lot of the data that doesn't exist for the for the access world, and make a recommendation to uh, to accelerate the the deployment of renewables in in the uh, off grid uh, context in. Uh, in particular. And there, uh, we have already gathered a, a series of data on, on, on off-grid, which is very, very interesting. And, and, and it's we are the only ones who have it for, uh, at this point in time. But also, we've gathered a lot of, of uh, um, knowledge and, and best practice in terms of policies. So we, we, we work through various platforms, different collaborations, capacity building activities, knowledge products in general to bring these different best practices, as I said, uh, together. And again, uh, we look a lot uh, on the design and, impl and, 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 and implementation of enabling policies. Uh, what kind of uh, tailor, tailored financing schemes and innovative business models and technology applications for both standalone and mini grids uh, that can be implemented? And as I said earlier, we look at this ecosystem that is needed to support livelihoods. So that means access to finance. How do you de-risk uh, tools and, and, and introduce conducive ownership models in the access context? What are the efficient technologies uh, that, that cater to specific needs? For example, we have a very nice publication on livelihoods. For the bottom of the pyramid, very often you will, this is, this is a part of, 
very basic technology that is helping a lot of, of people in their livelihoods that we did, nobody looks at, where how except of course certain institutions and we were uh, lucky to work with Selco in India uh, for repurposing a very basic technology with renewables to really improve livelihoods. Um, how to access new and uh, uh, or existing markets to sell products how to uh, uh, how important integrated research planning ha is it is for the national level policies and targets uh, and, and, and how to look at those interlinkages, for example, as I just mentioned about the healthcare facilities, for example, uh, for example, you should know that a billion people uh, today rely on health facilities uh, 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 without electricity supply. And there we also have uh, very important initiatives with WHO that looks at how to electrify uh, rural uh, health centers. So that's a little bit what we have, but of course we have a lot more which you can access on, on the on the website or, or, or just try to us and we will be very happy to reply. Thank you. We can see that Irena has really, it's a very rich source of knowledge in terms if you want to make and achieve successfully the transition in terms of energy. So thank you. I will take uh, another question from our audience online. The first question we have, what is the future of renewable energy and environmental protection in light of crisis, as well as the level of compliance with environmental agreements? Thank you for the question. I think it's a very nice question. Obviously, like any technology, and I think the, the person is probably referring, okay, there, there is different of the aspects to the question. One is uh, the future of renewable energy. I mean, I think the future of renewable energy is 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 obvious. It's not it's not a niche anymore in electricity, as we've seen in the pop in the in the presentation, but it's uh, moving uh, also uh, to to other sectors of the economy: heating, cooling, transport uh, at a much slower pace, but uh, given. Um, consideration of energy security, which is something that we have always uh, spoken about. Obviously, it's going it, to it's it's picking up. It has been picking up for a while, but also in terms of climate change necessity, right? That's another reason why uh, uh, why renewables and energy efficiency will uh, will increasingly play a very big role. But the question is very relevant also of in terms of the basically the environmental footprint of, of, of renewable energy as well. And that's a, a very important consideration. We are working on these. For example, we're looking at circular economy, but we're also looking at end of life renewable energy technology. So we're looking specifically this year at PV. We did a study four or five years ago around, around what can we do with PV waste uh, because obviously uh, some of the uh, PV um, uh, uh, plants are uh, coming to uh, end of life uh, uh, soon. So what do we do with that? How do we uh, we recycle the waste and how, what can we do with it? So we've done that already four or five years ago, but we're renewing this. One important aspect for that is regulation. At the time when we looked at it, we only saw regulations mostly in the US, uh, uh, which was mostly voluntary, but a lot in the European Union countries. And regulation is a very important aspect of that in order to recycle the waste from renewable energy. Another aspect that we're looking at, and this is gonna come in our forthcoming report on uh, called, the, as a, you saw, the World Energy Transitions Outlook, where we look at rare, materi uh, rare minerals and, um, and uh, how to deal with those. Uh, as you know, very few countries have um, a, a lot, uh, or they're very concentrated. So we have to see not only in terms of uh, those countries supplying the, the, the raw material, but also what those countries can gain themselves from adding value in their economy from those and not be mere uh, uh, producers of uh, commodities that are exported uh, to the outside world, but how they can also uh, gain value from it and how that fits within environmental 
standards, etc. But absolutely right. These are all questions that we deal with, and they are real questions because we cannot look only at life cycle uh, of and footprints of uh, of uh, conventional uh, energy uh, conventional energy sources, but we also have to look at those on, uh, in renewables. Yeah, so we can say that we're really on the right. Uh, we we would be able to recycle all uh, the 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 I would say the solar panels coming from this energy from renewable energy. We we, we will get there, and we'll be able to protect the environment at the same time. So so uh, to which extent do we can uh, recycle everything I'm not sure I will we will tell you in a couple of months how, how far it is but but a large uh, a majority yes a majority and uh, that's for PV panels we're doing the same study for um, batteries um, a lot of the uh, we I just uh, e there is a lot of literature on on uh, on on wind and that uh, same thing. A large part of the of the of the equipment, uh, etc., can be recycled. So yeah, we. Which doesn't mean that there is uh, not a part that cannot be recycled or that needs further uh, research and development in order to see what we can do with that. But yeah, these are not questions that are unanswered at this point. We have there are solutions, and with time, yes, uh, I think that, that a lot can be done in terms of, of recycling and, and moving into this circular economy uh, uh, approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I will move now to a question about finance. What are the sources and mechanisms of financing for renewable energy projects in the private sector? especially small and medium enterprise and businesses. Yeah. So, okay, as I said earlier, we need a lot more finance. It is estimated that the <clears throat> the share of of uh, public finance is about 15% for renewables I'm, I'm talking and the rest should come from the the private sector. Mm -hmm. So this is a global number and it's not really true everywhere. So you will find for example we just have a report that we just uh, launched on Africa, where obviously the public share of uh, financing is much, much bigger than that. And where, so it will depend on the country conditions, on the perceived or real risk of financing, et cetera. Um, but same thing, I mean, whether it's, uh, uh, and those are a lot of large scale uh, projects. Uh, for the more the smaller kind of project, if that's the question, there's a lot of different facilities, um, uh, funding facilities that we can draw from. And again, uh, I, I don't think uh, it is clear from uh, the finance world that it's not, uh, uh, they claim that it is not a lack of of, of, uh, of, of finance, but it's a lack of um of um, of projects of um, that 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 is uh, sort of uh, hampering greater investment. So I think facilitating uh, project development in terms of pre feasibility studies of matching developers with financiers with. Uh, technology providers, et cetera, is, is very important, especially for smaller projects. Uh, and um, aggregating smaller projects is another important step. Um, and uh, ARENA itself has a facility, um, ETAF, which, which provides this kind of facilitation. And we can share with you again some, and you can find on the website also, we have a pipeline of projects that we try to facilitate in terms of, of finding financiers and project developers, but there are other uh, such um, uh, funds uh, that can uh, that can that can uh, facilitate uh, projects and provide the financing needed. But definitely, a lot of work is needed on that, and that's where I think the enabling framework is also important in terms of policies and a sort of conducive invest, uh, uh, investment environment for private sector to, to engage more. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rabia. We don't have a lot of time uh, anymore, but I will just take the last question, the third and last question from our audience. Uh, what is the importance of imposing tax penalties 
on companies that destroy the environment and the role of knowledge in reducing greenhouse gas emissions to protect future generations. Yeah, I think it's essential. Uh, the, the, the carbon pricing is, I think, what the person means. So carbon pricing is a, is a very important policy that many countries have introduced. Now, the discussion is about the level of carbon price, et cetera, and which countries to do it. This is where, where international the cooperation is very important, especially that certain countries, as I said earlier, are not really responsible for, for a lot of the, uh, of, the, of the emissions that we have today. But that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't all make an effort in, in that direction. So carbon pricing is important and um, taxing companies that pollute is essential, obviously, as well. And a I think we we have, as I said earlier, a very narrow, narrow, narrow window to come to um, to, to 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 take the right decisions. And those are two examples of policies, but there are many others: fiscal policies uh, and at the same time redistribution. But uh, uh, the fiscal policy can help can be uh, very very important. Um, uh, but 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 also our deployment policies, etc., in order to make sure that future generate that we don't leave to future generation a planet they cannot breathe in. Yeah, thank you. This is very important not to end up at the same point with a fossil fuel in terms of pollution or not really be, being able to have a, a an environmental friendly new energy transition in terms of uh, structure. So uh, I want to thank you. I, I just want to uh, to close. So with Dr. Rabia, we have seen uh, she she has provided us information about the renewable energy fr frameworks for energy transition, the socioeconomic benefits of a transformed energy system. We have she has also tapped on the education and the knowledge needs in in this energy transition uh, phase and. Also, at the end, we talked about renewable energy in the post-COVID recovery agenda. So what we need really is a structural shift when we talk about policy and even when we talk about industry and education and building skills. Uh, and uh, in, uh, it's evident that we, have, we need more financing in here. And to reach the net zero energy system by 2050, apparently we need $33 trillion to reach this point. So I would like, to, and if you need any to know more about this, you can access IRENA uh, website and platforms where you can find a lot of information and knowledge products on the website. So I would like to thank you again, Dr. Rabia, and also I thank all our audience with the interesting question that were addressed to us. Sorry for the question that we couldn't cover, but maybe we can follow up with you offline. Thanks a lot, thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for having us. Bye-bye.